Hello, this is Dr. Hannah Asil, and this is uh, paper 6, November 2021. This is the version 2 in Cambridge IGCSE chemistry uh, syllabus. Uh, let us take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. So the first question here says carbon dioxide is a colorless gas that is denser than air. Carbon dioxide can be made by reacting marble chips with dilute hydrochloric acid. A student tried to make and collect carbon dioxide gas using the apparatus shown. Name the substances labeled A and B. Please pay attention to the question. He's not telling you to name the apparatus. He's telling you to name what is the substance in there. So what is he reacting? Is reacting marble chips with dilute hydrochloric acid. So which one is A and which one is B? We should realize that A is the liquid one, so that would be the dilute hydrochloric acid, and B is the solid one, so that is marble chips. Now he's saying name the apparatus labeled C. Of course, you should know that C is called conical flask, or you could just say flask. Explain why very little carbon dioxide gas would be collected using the apparatus shown. This apparatus is wrong. I shouldn't use it to collect carbon dioxide. Why? If you look at the top, he says carbon dioxide is a colorless gas that is denser than air. And we said if a gas is denser than air, I don't collect it like this. This is called upward delivery. This is wrong. I should collect it by downward delivery. So the gas is denser than air. If you collect it like this, it will go out of the gas jar or it will fall out of the gas jar. Complete the diagram to show how carbon dioxide gas could be collected and the volume measured. Remember, first of all, carbon dioxide is a gas that dissolves in water. So um, usually we shouldn't collect it over water. I want to collect it. And measure the volume, we usually use a gas syringe. Please practice drawing a gas syringe. It should be two tubes or a plunger inside the gas syringe with uh, an indication that there is graduation inside the gas syringe. At the end of the experiment, there were unreacted marble chips and aqueous calcium chloride in the item of apparatus label C. So at the end, we, he says the marble chips were excess. So I will have at the end unreacted marble chips. That's a solid at the bottom of the flask. And my product that I want is a solution of calcium chloride. Now describe how you would find the mass of unreacted marble chips. So I want to know how much marble chips remained at the end. Of course, the marble chips are things that do not dissolve in water. So what you do is you filter through filter paper and funnel. Then you get the unreacted marble chips as residue. Now wash the residue with a few drops of distilled water. Dry between filter papers and weigh using a balance. And that is what he wants. He wants the mass of the marble chip. The second question says a student investigated the reaction between two different solutions of aqueous sodium carbonate. So K and L are sodium carbonate solutions. And two different solutions of acid, acid M and acid N. In the first experiment, he put a burette filled with solution K. So that is sodium carbonate solution K. Some of the solution of K was run out of the burette so that the level of the solution K on is, was on the burette scale. So he's just filling with solution K and adjusting the scale. Using a measuring cylinder, 25 centimeter cubed of acid M was poured into a conical flask. He puts five drops of methyl orange, so pay attention. He's putting methyl orange on what? On acid in the flask. Um, the conical flask was placed on a white tile. Solution K was added slowly from the burette to the conical flask while the flask was swirled. Remember, while uh, we're doing titration, we should be swirling the flask until the solution just changed color and then he wants us to read this burette reading you should pay attention and read it properly if he has point something then you have all the readings should be to one decimal place 
So if this is 31 again, I'm going to remind you that we always read from the small number to the big number. So the burette is from up to down. So this is 31 point something, not 32 point something. 31.6 and the initial, and pay attention, which one is the final and which one is the initial, do not write them in the wrong place. So some people write the initial reading in the first line. In the first line, he wants the final. So 31.6 and the initial is 8.0. So the difference is the volume that I use. The difference is 23.6. Then he did experiment two. He said the conical flask was emptied and rinsed with distilled water. The burette was refilled with solution K. Some of solution K was run out of the burette. Remember that solution K was uh, the other solution of carbonate, sodium carbonate. Using a measuring cylinder, 25 centimeter cubed of acid N was put into the conical flask. Again, he added five drops of methyl orange. The conical flask was placed on a white tile. And he has this burette readings. Again, I'm going to read the burette readings very accurately. So this would be 15.9, 4.1. The difference between them is 11.8. Then he did another experiment in which the burette was emptied, rinsed with distilled water. Conical flask was emptied and rinsed. The burette was filled with solution L, sum of solution L was run out of the burette. Now he's using acid N, five drops of methyl orange, and he's uh, reading the final and initial. Again, these should be the readings that you get. State the color change observed at the end point in the conical flask. Again, we're going to remind ourselves, we go back to the beginning of the experiment. What did he say? He put in the, into the flask acid, and then he added methyl orange. If I'm titrating with methyl orange, do you remember the colors of methyl orange? You should remember I'm adding methyl orange to something acid in the flask. That means I'm starting with red. Red to what? Remember, in, we add until it is neutral. Methyl orange is orange when it is neutral. So the methyl orange will change from red to orange. Describe one other observation made when solution K was added to acid. You're going to go back and you're going to find out that solution K was carbonate. You're adding carbonate to acid. When you add carbonate to acid, what do you see? You should see bubbles of gas because carbonate with acid will give carbon dioxide gas. Compare the volumes of solution K used in experiment 1 and experiment 2. What was the volume in experiment 1? He used 23.6. In experiment 2, he used what? 11.8. Compare the volumes. And notice that you have two marks. So please don't say that one is more than the other. Of course, experiment 1 is more than experiment 2, but it's not just more, it's actually twice. So volume in experiment 1 is twice the volume in experiment 2. So just why they use different volumes. If I say that I used twice the volume of K in one, that means that the solution that was in the flask is more concentrated than the other one. So I, solution M needed 23.6. Solution N needed 11.8. The one that needed more is the more concentrated. So solution M is more concentrated than solution N. Or actually, we should say it's actually twice as concentrated as solution L. Deduce the volume of solution L required to reach the endpoint if experiment 3 is repeated using acid M. Now, we have decided that M is twice as concentrated as N. So, the volume that he, he got for N should be twice. So, this is the volume that you should get if you are using M. Explain why the conical flask was rinsed with water at the start of the experiment. Again, when we rinse the apparatus with water at the beginning, it is to remove traces of a previous solution or to remove residues from a previous solution. At the start of experiment 3, the burette was rinsed with water. Describe an additional step that should have been done after rinsing the burette with water 
but before filling the burette with solution L. I'm going to remind you that when we do any titration, the burette has to be rinsed twice. We have to wash it twice. Once with water, and we said we will wa uh, wash it with water to remove traces of a previous solution. And then I need to wash it with the solution that I'm going to fill it with. So I'm going to fill it with L. That means I need to rinse it with solution L in order to remove the traces of water still in the burette. I don't want water in the burette when I fill it with solution L. So I wash it first with solution L to remove water. Explain why the conical flask is placed on a white tile. You should know that when we do titrations, our flask should be on something white. We put a white paper or a white tile, and this is to see the color change clearly. Describe how the reliability of the results can be confirmed. Whenever he asks this question, you should say repeat the experiment and compare the results or uh, determine the anomalous result. State one source of error in experiment one and suggest an improvement. So I go back and find out what did he say about experiment one? He said use a measuring cylinder to measure 25 centimeter cubed of acid. You should know that we never use a measuring cylinder for that. We should use a pipette to measure 25 centimeter cubed of the acid. When we're doing titration, what you put into the conical flask is usually put using a pipette. This question says we have solid O and liquid P, and he's telling me that solid O is ammonium bromide. So solid O is what? Ammonium bromide. Then he's saying he is adding to the first portion of solution O, he's adding aqueous ammonia. If we have ammonium and we're adding aqueous ammonia, remember that the test for ammonium, we don't add aqueous ammonia because aqueous ammonia is the same as an ammonium solution. So we don't add aqueous ammonia because if I add aqueous ammonia, there is no change. We usually test ammonium by adding sodium hydroxide, not aqueous ammonia. So the second portion of solution O, approximately 2 cm cubed of aqueous sodium hydroxide was added. The mixture formed was warm. A gas was given off. He's saying the gas given off was tested. If I test the gas given off, remember, adding sodium hydroxide and warming, this is test for ammonium. If I do that to the ammonium, it will give ammonia gas, which turns damp red litmus paper to blue because it is ammonia gas. Are we all following? Okay, to so the third portion of solution O, approximately one centimeter cubed of dilute nitric acid, followed by a few drops of silver nitrate were added. Again, silver nitrate is test for what? We said silver nitrate is test for halides, chloride, bromide, iodide. If I have chloride, I should get white precipitate, bromide, cream precipitate, Iodide, yellow precipitate. Now, which one do I have? I have bromide, so I should have cream precipitate. To the fourth portion of solution O, he added aqueous chlorine. Remember, he's adding chlorine to what? To something bromide. So, if I add chlorine to something bromide, chlorine is more reactive than bromine, it will displace it. I will end up with bromine in my solution. And that means I will see the solution turns orange. Okay. Tests on the liquid P. A few drops of liquid P were placed in a crucible. A lighted splint was applied to the surface of liquid P. It burned with a flame and lots of smoke. Remember, if I put a lighted splint and the liquid burns, what this tells you is that I have a flammable organic compound or you could be specific like something like ethanol for example but in general it would be an organic compound that is flammable a few drops of liquid p were added uh, to a test tube containing one centimeter cubed of aqueous bromine the color changed from orange to colors aqueous bromine is test for what 
Remember, aqueous bromine is the same as bromine water. When we add bromine water to something and it changes from orange to colorless, this is test for alkene. So that means that I have a flammable organic compound that is an alkene. Okay, then the last question says cobalt is a metal. Cobalt is between copper and iron in the reactivity series. This mineral contains the compound cobalt 2-carbonate and no other metal ions. Cobalt 2-carbonate is insoluble in water, reacts with dilute acids to form an aqueous solution of a salt. Describe how you would obtain a sample of cobalt metal starting with a large lump of this compound. You have access to all normal laboratory apparatus and chemicals. How do we do that? So I have a large lump of what? I have a large lump of something that has cobalt carbonate and I want to change it into cobalt. I want to get the cobalt metal. So basically what should we do? So first of all, I need to dissolve it in acid, filter, and then I'm going to react it with something that will give cobalt. So for example, the first thing that we do is I should crush the lumps. He says I use a large lump of this. I should crush the lump in a mortar and pestle. Again, when you're explaining this, please do not forget to mention the apparatus that is being used. Then what should I do? I should add the acid. So let us choose an acid, dilute sulfuric acid, for example, or dilute um, hydrochloric acid to the solid, stir with a glass rod, you should know that carbonates react, dissolve, give bubbles of hydrogen gas. Now, I can take this solution and filter it through filter paper and funnel to remove any insoluble impurities. Then, I need to add a more reactive metal to displace the cobalt. So, I can tell him add magnesium powder, for example, to the solution. The cobalt metal will precipitate out. In order to get this cobalt metal, then I can filter through filter paper and funnel. I get the cobalt as a residue, wash the residue with a few drops of distilled water, and dry between filter paper. Okay, so that was the end of this paper. I hope it was useful to you. Thank you for listening.